from Harvard University is going to talk about this laser cooling of typical and atypical molecules. <laughs> Take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking to you about our work of laser cooling both diatomics as well as polyatomic molecules. Uh, so this will really be a two-part talk. Uh, in the first half, half of the talk, I'll be focusing specifically on work we've done on calcium chloride uh, and talking a bit about the, a very recent result from dipolar interactions between uh, CF molecules and tweeters. And in the second half of this talk, I'll uh, move on to talk about more complex molecules, specifically focusing on the polyatomic molecule CaOH, <coughs> and talk there about uh, some of the work we've done on cooling and trapping this molecule, as well as studying its uh, bending mode lifetime, and using this molecule uh, basically as a roadmap experiment for the future EDM experiments. Uh, so as you've already heard throughout this conference or workshop, uh, you, there are many different uh, diatomic molecules now that have been laser cooled. Uh, and each of these different uh, species have various advantages and disadvantages. Um, you've heard a lot about many groups working on calcium chloride, which is what I'll talk more about today. Uh, but then there's also other molecules, for example, uh, the molecules of UV transitions that seem to be very promising for very efficient deceleration and trapping, as well as molecules that have relevancy to both chemistry and precision measurements, and EDM-sensitive molecules that are very heavy, such as uh, YBF and BAF. Uh, so how do these uh, experiments uh, produce ultra -cool molecules? Well, we all follow the standard uh, path towards laser cooling, uh, where we start with a molecular source, uh, in this case, again, buffer gas cooling, and then we apply laser slowing to these molecules and trap them in a magneto-optical trap. Uh, from this point here, the molecules in the MOT, as you've heard, are still quite hot to uh, basically subdoppler heating forces or Sisyphus-like heating forces. Uh, and to counteract this, we then apply some sort of subdoppler cooling to reach temperatures down to about 4 microkelvin. And then finally, once we have these cold molecules, we can then load them into optical dipole traps. And then this further increases both our density and phase space density uh, up considerably uh, from the initial starting points of the first MOTs. Uh, so just as a brief recap of how our MOTs look like, uh, we can make both uh, DC and RF MOTs of these calcium fluoride molecules. Uh, and the initial iteration had about 10 to 5 molecules, and our upgraded version now has about a million trapped molecules. Uh, and within this upgraded uh, new apparatus, uh, we also get densities of about 10 to the 8 or so in this uh, tightly compressed uh, MOT. Uh, as far as the, uh, the cooling, the subdoppler cooling works, uh, we use uh, this lambda enhanced gray molasses cooling, which you've already heard a lot about, uh, where you combine basically uh, gray molasses cooling, which relies on motional coupling from dark states into bright states, uh, with this basically three level system that you get uh, via CPT or velocity selective coherent population trapping, and you get a, zero, a dark state at zero velocity. And when you combine both of these cooling techniques, uh, we see that we get the standard, uh, basically, lambda enhanced features where you have a, a very cold temperature when you're at zero detuning, and as you move away from this detuning, you see a heating feature. And we reach temperatures about 4 microkelvin or so in free space doing this. Once we have these cold molecules, we can then optically trap them, uh, and we see that this lambda enhanced cooling actually works in the presence of the optical trapping light because we can actually load the molecules basically from the molasses into uh, this dipole trap and further increase the density. And basically each of these steps that we do in this experiment is basically just to gain uh, both density and phase space density of our molecules. Once we did this, we were then able to move on uh, to actually loading these molecules into optical tweezer arrays. Uh, so these optical tweezer arrays are simply very tightly focused uh, optical tweezer traps, uh, which uh, each of them have a, a volume that makes the light-induced collision rate high enough such that you always end up in this what's known as a collision blockade regime. Basically, all this means is that the rate of light-induced collision is so high that the moment you load in two molecules, they'll in immediately undergo inelastic loss, and you'll always end up with either zero or one molecule in each of these traps on a single uh, experimental cycle. Uh, and th the other thing I want to point out is that the very, these traps are extremely small. Uh, which is why we actually have to load them from directly from the optical dipole trap, which has a much increased density compared to, for example, the molasses. Because if you were to actually like pull out a phase space density number, for example, of these tweezer traps, uh, you'd see that it's on the order of about 10 minus 4 or so. 
We can also do uh, interesting things such as we can uh, rearrange these traps as well as uh, re-image them after we do rearrangement. And we see we have quite high fidelity for this uh, rearrangement and, and re-imaging. Uh, we can also have coherent manipulation of these molecules within these tweezer traps by a combination of optical pumping pulses and microwave transfer. And we can see we can drive nice Rabi oscillations between different uh, rotational states within our molecule. So now that we've built up basically this coherent control and this single site uh, particle control of this molecule, the first thing we did with these molecules was actually to study collisions. Uh, and the way we studied collisions was by taking two of these optical tweezer traps, merging them together for a variable amount of time, waiting for the collisions to take place, and then re-separating them and then re-imaging them. And basically in the preparation step, before we merge them, we can do uh, state prep so that we can put basically these molecules in any internal state that we want. Uh, additionally, we have to re-separate them before we re-image them because if you was to simply uh, image what would happen uh, when you had two molecules in a trap, they'd simply undergo this very, very quick light-assisted collisions and you'd always end up with uh, nothing remaining. Uh, so we can see how this works. So first we can run this sequence but only load a molecule in one of the two traps but have the other trap empty and we see that we have essentially no loss over this time scale. By contrast, if we then post-select on experimental cycles where both of these tweezer traps are loaded, uh, we see very clear signs of collisions uh, from this decay curve here. And we can then repeat this uh, experimental sequence uh, for basically a whole host of various internal states, whether it be an excited rotational state, the absolute ground state, or some spin stretch states in the ground states. But no matter what state we put the molecules in, we find that uh, quite reoccurring themes in collisions of ultra cool molecules, which is we get basically universal loss no matter what state they're in. Uh, and there's been, as you've heard, a lot of work on trying to understand why we get this. Uh, so uh, there's been many different theories, for example, sticky collisions, complex formations, and for example, photo excitation of then these complexes uh, by the trap light themselves. So what exactly is limiting us here is not clear yet, we haven't actually investigated that, but there's a lot of different uh, possible theories for what's happening. But really what we want is not so much to study these collisions, it's really to suppress these collisions because we really don't want the molecules to disappear when we put them together or, and have high density. Uh, so this really brings about the idea of shielding molecular collisions. Uh, so the idea here is that, again, when the two molecules come to short range, they seem to undergo some sort of inelastic loss process. And we really want to prevent these molecules from coming to short range. Uh, and the way this we, can, we can do this is by what's generically called shielding, which basically is some way of engineering some potential between these molecules such that they can never actually make it to short range and thus never undergo inelastic loss. Uh, and there's many, many different uh, theory proposals on how this can be implemented in molecules, uh, ranging from electric field shielding, microwave shielding, optical shielding, and also combinations of microwave and electrical field shielding and so on. Uh, and basically all of these different uh, shielding processes, again, all create basically the same type of repulsive barrier between these molecules at short range. Uh, so specifically what we investigated was uh, microwave shielding of these molecules. So this was a theory proposal from Tice Common and Jeremy Hudson where the idea is that uh, if we resonantly dress the microwaves, uh, sorry, the molecules with microwaves, uh, we, we create basically a repulsive potential uh, in, the, in this upper dress state. Uh, similarly, there's also an anti-dressed, an anti-shielded state here where the, the rate of, in, of, of inelastic loss would be increased because you're now attracting the molecules to short range. Now, there's another thing I want to point out about this shielding, which is the fact that not only does uh, this shielding scheme decrease the rate of inelastic loss, uh, it also increases the rate of elastic collisions. So this is actually very useful, for example, if you want to do evaporative cooling of these molecules in the future, uh, because now you'll see that your, your ratio of basically elastic to inelastic uh, collisions is actually very, very high. Now there is one complication to this. Uh, which is you need a very clean polarization of your microwaves, and specifically you need very clean circularly polarized microwaves at the rotational frequency of 20 gigahertz, and you need quite high um, Rabi frequencies. Uh, so this was quite a technical challenge to actually implement, and I don't want to go into all the details, but 
Uh, just as a brief overview, we actually produce these circularly polarized microwaves with a helical antenna array. Uh, and one of the main limitations we saw uh, in this experiment that we actually didn't realize when we first started out uh, was the fact that uh, if you have basically phase noise on your microwaves at the Rabi frequency, this basically becomes a direct drive between this shielded state into this anti-shielded state. And we can see this experimentally that uh, this dress state lifetime is basically purely limited by the phase noise of our microwave. So if, as, as we change out our, for different microwave sources with different phase noise, uh, we can see very clearly that the dress state lifetime increases as we go to lower and lower phase noise. Uh, there's other complications about uh, getting actually high power at 20 gigahertz and the fact that many things absorb at 20 gigahertz. Uh, and you also have to worry about phase stability uh, of your microwave, specifically the phase stability between all of your different uh, array antennas in this helical array. Uh, but once we solve all that, what we can do is actually drive quite cleanly, quite clean circular polarized microwaves, uh, quite clean polarized, sorry, we can drive uh, microwave transitions with very clean polarization. Uh, and what we can do is we can test this uh, by driving basically different MF states in our molecules. Uh, and from this, we extract that we have a ratio of basically of left-handed to right-handed circular polarization light of about 100 to 1. Uh, and we can also achieve very high Rabi frequencies of about 30 megahertz or so uh, on this transition. So now that we have the microwaves under control, we can now go back and repeat the collisions we did earlier, but with this shielding uh, on. So again, this is the same sequence as we did earlier, where we take two tweezers, merge them together. But this time, we turn on this shielding. Uh, and then we wait for a variable amount of time before we re-separate an image. And now what you see is that uh, initially with no shielding, you have this gray line here. But when you put them in this shielded state, you'll see that the collision rate, actually the inelastic loss decreases uh, as is shown here in this blue trace. Uh, we can also put them in the anti-shielded state and you can see the rate of inelastic loss actually increases. Uh, and uh, we also see that uh, it agrees quite well with theory as to uh, as we increase the Rabi frequency of our microwave, basically this, the the barrier bit of this of this shielding increases and the shielding factor increases. Uh, and at basically the optimal shielding parameters, uh, we see that <coughs> sorry, we see that the uh, the lifetime is increased by about a factor of six or so. But what we really care about is not just how much is the shield, how much does, is this loss suppressed, but it's also really just the ratio of this elastic uh, to inelastic loss. So the next thing we did was act actually uh, experimentally measure what is the ratio of elastic to inelastic uh, collisions in our system. Uh, and we find that uh, it is indeed uh, over 50 and agrees quite well with uh, theoretical predictions. Uh, so this seems like a very promising uh, platform for future evaporative cooling. And we very, trickly, very quickly tried uh, to do evaporative cooling on this system, uh, but we only saw about a 30% uh, decrease in temperature, which was limited just by this dress state lifetime issue that I mentioned earlier. And I actually want to point out some recent work by uh, the MPQ group working on fermionic NAK, uh, where they now use the same microwave shielding scheme, uh, but because of their much higher densities of their uh, basically near degenerate NAK samples, they see very efficient uh, evaporation uh, and can actually uh, evaporate to below quantum degeneracy. So now, if we, now that we have the basically single particle uh, system under control for collisions, we also want to look at how does our, uh, basically what is the coherence of a single particle or single molecule in a tweezer trap. Uh, so to do this, we've identified a set, a state, a, a set of states uh, in, our, in our calcium fluoride molecule. Uh, and this set of, this set of states uh, is actually insensitive to both magnetic fields as well as electric fields to first order. And this allows us, in combination with tuning both the magnetic field as well as the polarization of our light, to engineer basically a magic angle condition. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, as we tune uh, basically uh, the polarization angle, uh, we can tune such that the differential light shift basically has a zero derivative. And this means that we're basically minimally sensitive to the position of the molecules in the tweezer trap and the effect of uh, this tensor light shift. Uh, and we see that as we tune 
uh, this magic angle condition, we uh, see this very clear two-peak feature, which corresponds to basically uh, these two level crossings of when this second order derivative of the, the, the light shift goes to zero. Uh, so then we can park on basically the peak of this, of this magic condition, uh, and we can measure the coherence time. So we measure about 100 milliseconds or so Ramsey coherence time, and with a spin echo pulse, we can then extend this to about half a second or so. Um, maybe even more promising is the, the fact that if you then look at what is this coherence time limited by, uh, you see that it's basically purely limited by just thermal motion, uh, which means in the future, if you want to uh, get even longer coherence times, uh, we simply need to cool the molecules further down in these tweezer traps. But maybe the point I'd like to make is that even with these lifetimes that we have here of 100 milliseconds or even half a second of a spin echo, uh, these coherence times are much longer, are much greater than the predicted gate time. So in a sense, this is already a useful qubit uh, to be used. Uh, so with this in mind, we've then set out to build basically a new next generation apparatus. Um, and this apparatus is really focused on looking for dipolar interactions and using uh, CF molecules in optical tweezers as, as qubits or for quantum simulation. Uh, and just a quick highlight of this apparatus, uh, we have the ability to now load molecules into a glass cell, uh, and this gives us the ability to have very high NA uh, objectives for high fidelity imaging. It also gives us much tight, more tightly focused tweezer traps uh, to do future Raman sideband cooling as well as uh, for better interactions between the molecules. Uh, additionally, there's a few uh, things. We have uh, the, the ability to put high voltage electrodes as well as have this entire system be cryogenic for much longer lifetimes and basically full tunability of this system. Uh, and just a few highlights from the system. So here is where we have about a million molecules uh, in this trap. Uh, and we also have to do, now do uh, optical transport from the MOT region into the glass cell. Uh, and to do this, we've actually devised a new uh, method of optical transport, uh, which is a combination of a moving lattice plus a moving ODT. And we actually have to use this simply because molecules, even though we've worked quite hard to get them quite cold, are still significantly hotter than uh, what you'd typically get with uh, ultra-cold atoms uh, in optical traps. Uh, and with this, we are able to transport about half a meter or so in under 50 milliseconds. Uh, and now that we can transport the molecules into this uh, glass cell, we can now load the molecules into these nice large optical tweezer arrays uh, and also do rearrangement if we want. Now, if we actually want to look for dipolar interactions between these things, there's a few things we want to do. We want to bring two tweezers close together, uh, but we also want to make sure that as you bring two tweezers close together, the, the light from the tweezer doesn't interact or cause heating of the molecules within them. Uh, which is a problem when you typically bring two tweezer lights together, they start beating with one another. Uh, so to actually counteract this, what we do is we have actually a dual AOD setup uh, where we basically interlace two different uh, arrays of these, of these CF molecules, and we can then bring them in basically arbitrarily close without any heating uh, present. This also allows us to do site-resolved imaging uh, by tuning uh, the power and detuning uh, the microwave transitions in one set of tweezer traps from the other, we can then drive Rabi oscillations, for example, on one site while not affecting the, the neighboring site. Uh, and then once we have this, the next thing we did was to actually look for dipolar interactions. So this is very similar to what uh, you saw yesterday from Lawrence, which is now uh, we can prepare the two molecules uh, basically in opposite n equal one, n equal zero, and we can look for basically spin, uh, spin exchange between these two sites. Uh, and that's what's shown here. Basically, as we change the distance between these two molecules, uh, we see that the rate of spin exchange uh, changes as you'd expect. Uh, we can also ask what is our limiting uh, factor in this coherence time that we measure, and this appears to fit well to uh, just thermal noise. Uh, and we can see this actually by, depending on the orientation of our uh, basic quantization axis with the tweezer trap, uh, we can increase or decrease the coherence time that we measure. As, so as a brief outlook on the CF side, uh, in the future we want to increase this, uh, basically the coherence time that we have uh, of, of, of these uh, qubits, 
uh, by doing Raman sideband cooling of these molecules with these traps. And this will allow us to then produce high fidelity Q two qubit gates uh, and, for fu for, and to use them for future quantum simulation. Uh, additionally, in the future, uh, we can use them to do high fidelity qubit gates and have increased interaction strength and also study uh, other systems such as Rydberg and, and uh, molecule systems. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude the CF part of this talk. Uh, so the Gen 2 work was led by Yi Cheng and Scarlett, uh, and then uh, the Gen 1 work uh, was done by uh, Sean, as well as our PI John, uh, and our collaborators on the experiment, Wolfgang, Conquin, and Umi, uh, as well as Tice for the theory work on, on all the shielding stuff we've done. So now everything I've talked about so far was on laser cooling of a diatomic molecule. But now can we extend this to more complex molecules, to polyatomics or even more complex? Uh, so for this, you'll hear more about this later on today, but let's just look at why would you want to do this. And this really has to do with the fact that when you go to a polyatomic molecule, you've now gained uh, angular momentum around your internuclear axis. And this then generically gives rise uh, to near-degenerate opposite parity doublets. And these parity doublets can then be used for many applications because they can be very easily polarized uh, within your molecule. And the, not only can they be easily polarized, uh, you'll see that uh, there's actually uh, the ability to turn on and off the dipole interaction depending on which state you're in. And because of uh, these nice features, there's actually been a wide range of applications proposed for these polyatomic molecules ranging from precision measurements uh, where you can use them for laser coolable EDM sensitive, as laser coolable EDM sensitive molecules, or as, as uh, to use them for studies of ultralight dark matter sensitivity. Uh, you can also study uh, ultra cold collisions and ultra cold chemistry, uh, as well as use them for future quantum simulation and quantum computation applications. Now, how do we actually achieve laser cooling on a molecule like this? Well, on top of the uh, degrees of freedom we have in a diatomic molecule, here we have also a bending mode of this molecule as well as a hybrid mode which basically uh, has a combination of the stretching mode uh, as well as this bending mode. Uh, and we can look at this molecule of interest, CaOH, and we can ask how many basically different decay channels are there down to basically the 10 minus 4 level, which is about the number of photons we need to actually do laser cooling of this molecule. Uh, and we can identify all of these states and we can then also then repump all of these states with various lasers. Uh, so we have about a dozen lasers or so, uh, and this allows us to then cycle about uh, over 10,000 photons per each of these uh, CaOH molecules. Uh, so this is now enough to actually go about to do uh, all the laser cooling that we've done on CAF, now on CaOH. Uh, so with that, we're able to create a magneto-optical trap of these CaOH molecules. Uh, and additionally, we can then uh, perform the same sub-Doppler cooling uh, as this lambda enhanced gray molasses cooling and cool the molecules down uh, to about 20 microkelvin or so in free space. Now that again we have these cold molecules, uh, we can load them into an optical dipole trap uh, by simply overlapping a dipole trap with this uh, cold molasses cloud. Uh, and we load a, a few hundred molecules within this trap currently. One of the first things we've done with these uh, optically trapped molecules is then to actually study what is the lifetime of this bending mode. So this bending mode, which has this opposite parity doublet state that you'd want for future quantum science applications, is actually a, an excited state because it has one uh, quant of, of, of bent angular momentum. So this, this state can then decay back down uh, to the ground state at some time. Uh, so we can pump the molecules into the state and then we can simply look at what is the, the loss rate and we see it agrees quite well with uh, some theoretic cal theoretical calculations from uh, our collaborators at John Hopkins uh, showing that we have a spontaneous lifetime of the state of about uh, 600 milliseconds or so. So this should already be long enough for much of the applications we want to use this molecule for. Now, we also want to regain the single quantum state control that we had on CF on this molecule. Uh, so again, we can do this with a combination of optical pumping pulses as well as microwave pulses uh, to populate most of the population into a single quantum state. Uh, and then once they're in a single quantum state, we can then drive uh, uh, coherent Rabi oscillations of this state. Now, additionally, I want to point out there's actually an EDM sensitive state here uh, which could be used for future EDM measurements. Now, CAOH on its own is not 
heavy enough to be uh, really that useful uh, for future experiments, but it will have the same generic features that a more heavy uh, polyatomic molecule would have. Uh, so with this, we've set, up, set out on, to do a new basically roadmap experiment on using these polyatomic molecules uh, for EDM searches. So this is in collaboration with uh, the group of Nick Hutzler at Caltech. Uh, and what we see is that uh, these molecules, such as CAOH, actually generically have access to a zero G factor EDM state. So this is a state that basically as you tune the electric field, you uh, can get a zero crossing in the sensitivity to your magnetic field. So this is of course very nice for EDM experiments because you don't want to be sensitive to any stray external uh, magnetic fields that might influence or decrease your contrast. But on top of this, not only does your coherent, not only does the, the G factor go to zero, the EDM sensitivity still remains. So this is, appears to be useful for a future EDM uh, experiment. Uh, so we can actually drive the molecules to this state. So we can, uh, with the optical pumping sequence I showed earlier, pump the molecules into this EDM state and drive coherent Rabi oscillations uh, within this state. Uh, and then we can perform a spin precession measurement of this uh, EDM state. Uh, we simply apply a pi over two pulse here down to create a superposition of these two states uh, and then let this state process as a function of time and then read this out as a function of time. And we see that we get very clear uh, spin precession uh, fringes as shown here. Uh, and we can map out where the, the, this zero crossing of this G factor occurs. Additionally, we can ask what is the limitation in coherence times that we see for these spin precession measurements. Uh, and we see that uh, at a far away from this uh, zero crossing was limited by uh, magnetic field noise in the lab environment. But then as we approach the zero G factor state, we see that uh, we can now increase the coherence time significantly. Uh, and for high magnetic fields, you're limited by uh, some AC stock shifts of your trap light. Basically, the, the way to think about this is that the zero crossing depends on the intensity of your trap light. And because your, your molecules have some finite temperature, they explore some finite range of this, of this light shift. And this causes uh, dephasing. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude the COH part of this, of this talk. Uh, and just to say that uh, in the near future, we're working on, on actually loading these molecules into a blue detuned MOT uh, for the reason that we want uh, increased molecules loaded into our optical dipole trap. And we're also working towards realizing uh, optical tweezers of these COH molecules. And maybe I'll just conclude with the uh, basic idea with that as you add complexity into your system, you also add additional possibilities. Uh, so this is shown here for various quantum simulations, but this also applies, for example, to future precision measurements and so on. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the entire COH team, uh, Nathaniel, Christian, and Paige, uh, as well as our uh, collaborators from Caltech and John Hopkins, and of course, John Doyle. And thank you for your attention.